Did you ever come across an old piece of tech? Maybe you have a classic compact Mac laying in a closet, or maybe there's a dusty old VCR in the attic. Or maybe you're lucky enough to have an arcade sitting in your basement. Problem is that you've never actually seen them function, and you're concerned what's going to happen when you plug it in and turn it on. To be honest, I'm not. But there's a science to that. Let's talk about what you can look for before you go ahead and power on that old piece of tech. Alright everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is episode one of our Macintosh Classic i7 series. In this video, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to operating old technology. Now we are going to go ahead and focus on this Mac Classic 2, or in this case this Macintosh Performance 200, but I'm going to try to do, uh, do the, my best to provide some generalities when it comes to working okay, with old tech. Now before we go further, I am going to warn you, the whole purpose of this video is not to refurb this Mac Classic 2. Remember, this is a shell. Our goal here is to talk about the specific things you should look for before you plug in your old piece of tech and make matters worse. Typically, I prescribe to the idea, if it's broke, you can't make it worse. But when it comes to old technology, sometimes what looks broke is actually a few little pieces away from being fully functional. And if you go ahead and you power this thing on, and there are things that weren't taken care of, things can go very bad very quickly. I hope at the end of this video, you're not mad at me because I'm sacrificing what could be a working Mac Classic 2. There's a ton of these. And I do plan at some point in a later video, actually working through and making this hardware functional so that someone else can go ahead and use it. But for the time being, I figured, why don't we go ahead and take this apart, talk about what we're looking at, things to look for if you decide you want to pick up a classic compact Mac or any other piece of tech. All right, so you're prepared to go ahead and actually, you know, refurb it and not ruin it. Now, before I actually begin disassembly, I'm going to go ahead and put a warning out there. I guess you could call it PSA. We are working with an old piece of tech, specifically something that has a CRT. Anything that uses analog electronics that has high voltage circuitry inside can be dangerous. I have a lot of experience when it comes to CRTs, and I'm going to do my best to point out the things you can do in order to go ahead and be relatively safe. You could mess this up and take a couple thousand volts of a shock and you will not be happy. So I'm letting you know right now, I am not responsible for anything that you do wrong if you follow any of my advice. All right, so look, before you begin any project, you need to identify what space you're gonna work in. In this case, I'm in my classroom. I have plenty of space, I have plenty of light. Obviously, I have plenty of tools, okay, at my disposal to go ahead and do a project like this. Now, if you don't have the space, you have to be a little creative. And I can tell you, your kitchen table, okay, if you have one, is probably the best place. You get overhead light, plenty of room. The tools, you're gonna have to commandeer as you come and go. Luckily with this Mac Classic, okay, there's not a ton of tools you need to actually pull it apart, but if you start to work and be a little bit more advanced in your refurb, you're going to need some more specialized equipment. If you just want to pull it apart and take a look what's going on, these things, okay, don't require anything too special. Now, you may have heard the term Mac Cracker before, and so what it is, is a specialized screwdriver in order for you to go ahead and fit okay, your screwdriver inside of the top handle to get two of the four case screws out. Now, it's not specialized. All this is a T15 Torx. I don't even think it's a security bit now that I think about it, but it's gotta be at least 12 to 18 inches long to fit inside of the handle to get it out. Now, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not spending the 12 to $13 on a single screwdriver in order to go ahead and crack open a compact Mac the three or four times in my life that I need to. So. Like most projects, sometimes I've got to be creative. My iFixit kit has an extension. Now I'm going to warn you, it's flexible. In fact, I'll go ahead and I'll pull it out so you can see it. Flex. It's not the greatest to do something like this, but in a pinch, it'll get the job done. So if you don't have a T15 Torx bit, you're going to have to find one. 
But as far as the extension is concerned, you'd be surprised what you can make work. Now with this Mac Classic, there are only four case screws to take care of. You've got two equally accessible screws at the bottom of the case, and then you've got the two screws inside of the handle that we need the extension or the Mac Cracker screwdriver to take care of. Now, I'm gonna use my extension for this, which is kind of entertaining to watch, but these are super easy. But there are some things to think about before you just start unscrewing old plastic. Now, it's within your best interest when you're working on an old piece of tech that's predominantly plastic to allow it to come up to room temperature or even a little bit warmer. That's gonna soften the plastic up, so if you've got a really tough screw, it should come out with ease. This, okay, hopefully isn't too big of a deal, and it's not. But if you ever have a piece of technology that you can't get a screw out of and you're in a pinch, the easiest way is to soften the plastic but not completely deform it. And so if you ever have to, you can use a soldering iron and you can go ahead and just put the tip of that soldering iron on the screw head and it should warm up the screw, which should then warm up the plastic. Now I'll warn you, something like this, okay, ABS plastic has a glass temp of somewhere around 210 degrees Celsius. I know that from some of my 3D printing expertise. Uh, but if you can go ahead and maybe get it to about 150 to 170, you'll go ahead and warm it up so you can get the screw out without damaging the threads. Because again, remember with heat, you get expansion. Now, for those of you that are working on a classic compact Mac, remember, you've got a CRT inside of this thing, which means it's got analog circuitry that could hold a lot of voltage. We wanna be cognizant of that when we pull this case off. You'll notice I flipped this thing around because I know where the power supply plug is is also where the analog board sits. That way I can keep that away from me, I can keep my hands clear, and prevent a shock if the bleed off resistor didn't do its job. Another thing to be cognizant of as you're pulling apart a plastic case and any old piece of tech, okay, is to not yank the thing apart with reckless abandon. Remember, this thing is old, and you have no idea what its history looks like. It may have come apart a dozen times in its life, so it's really easy. It may have never come apart and it's got years of grime and dust and et cetera, holding it together. So be gentle, and if it ever feels like it's stuck, it's probably because it is. And at least in my experience, you may have missed a fastener. Now luckily, we know this case only has four screws. I have the two here, the two here, so I know I can just pull it apart. So that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so we're back to this view. We've got this thing apart. Let's talk about just some basics when it comes to a compact mat. So we've got our CRT, this is our actual tube. All right, we've got this here, this is our anode, and that's going here to our flyback transformer. Now, we'll talk a little bit what you need to look for when it comes to the actual CRT side of things. All right, but I'm just trying to go over some basics of this layout. With your CRT, you get your neck tube here, all right, and then you get your neck board, this one's actually on there pretty good. Sometimes they're glued together. Sometimes they're haphazardly halfway coming apart. It really depends on how much this thing's moved around its light. Now your analog board, like we said, is here. We'll talk about that in a second. We've got our hard drive. Again, I'm not 100% sure what the functionality of this or if it's a 40 megabyte or an 80 megabyte version. Uh, we've got our power cable, okay? We've got our SCSI cable. And then those, okay, go to the, both the power supply and then the logic board, okay, respectively. Now, when it comes to this compact Mac, I typically leave the ribbon cable on the hard drive and I just go ahead and pull it off the logic board. I know some people like to remove it entirely. Uh, I just kind of go ahead and kind of get it out of my way. So I just leave it set up there. I go ahead and I pull the floppy cable and that comes out and that's a tiny little guy right there. We go ahead and do the same thing, just kind of run it out of our way and we remove the power connector, which is like basically a mini ATX connector. If you've ever worked with a PC, that's kind of the best way I can compare it. Although every Mac I've worked on has something similar to this, like mini size. Let me just shove that back there. All right, and then we go ahead and we can pull out 
this uh, logic board and we can go ahead and we can talk a little bit about what we see. All right, so look, it's one thing to know what the components are. We have our pram battery slot, uh, which is actually unpopulated. So I'm assuming someone at some point pulled this apart. Now we have a PDS sl slot that really served no purpose in the Mac Classic or Mac Classic 2, although there were some aftermarket uh, floating point units that were available for them, but nothing officially from Apple. We have a handful of other ICs that do a number of different things. We have our CPU here, we have our ROMs, we have our floppy connector, we have our SCSI connector, power connector, we have two slots for RAM, which were good up to, I believe, 10 megabytes in the Mac Classic and the Mac Classic 2. It's another to know what you're looking at so you know how to troubleshoot when something's not working. And the first thing I'm going to point out, okay, is going to be the pram battery. Now, we talked that this is unpopulated. Uh, but so the pram battery, or if you're using a PC, it's the BIOS or a console, okay, it could be a clock battery. Uh, anything that's battery related that gets old has a likelihood of leaking or even exploding. And everything I've seen, pram batteries, especially in old Macs, are absolutely notorious for exploding and leaking electrolyte everywhere. I will tell you that electrolyte is a corrosive substance when it comes to old electronics. So clearly somebody knew what they were doing when they pulled this apart because it's gone. And it actually doesn't look like there's any corrosion here to speak of. Now I will tell you that this board looks like it's been cleaned before. And we're going to talk about that process, albeit it's not super clean, but it does look like somebody tried, uh, obviously with no luck. Now other things you need to worry about, those are capacitors. And if you've watched any old electronics video, you know capacitors, 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 they're a huge deal. In the case of old Mac hardware, okay, these aluminum electrolytic capacitors are notorious, okay, for leaking. Sometimes they even explode, although I don't see the explosion happening as much as I see leaking. And with leaking, you get some of this green corrosion that you can see here. Some of it's on uh, the ABD connector in the back, and there is a little bit of that corrosion up here. Now what's nice is that somebody at some point had taken this apart and cleaned it and you can see that there's not really any corrosion on the front of the board, which is a really good sign that this is repairable. But you can't forget about taking a look at the back of the board because sometimes the electrolyte can leak through okay, and cause all sorts of problems, whether it's dry solder joints, okay, delamination of the PCB, or etc. So this board is a pretty good candidate to go ahead and actually repair. Again, beyond the scope of our video, but we can at least talk about things that should be done. And the first is gonna be a cap kit. So if we do a cap kit, we'd probably get this thing to run. But just because you do a cap kit doesn't mean all your problems go away. Another thing to think about, okay, is gonna be any of your socketed chips, okay, that are on the motherboard. And that includes Okay, our ROMs, which are right here, our RAM on this logic board. Some Macs have socketed CPUs. Practically every PC of the era had socketed CPUs, so on and so forth. What you should really do before any cap kit, as long as there's not an extensive amount of damage or leakage, is just reseat any of your socketed chips. Okay, grab a ROM puller, pull out the ROMs, put them back in, clean the contacts is probably a good idea reseat your RAM, reseat a CPU, and then go for it. Now, we don't know what the life of this Mac was. To be honest, it's actually pretty clean inside, so these caps should be in good shape, even if they're leaking a little bit. But eventually, as you get to the end of their life, they are more prone to failure, which means leakage, upright, straight out, no more function, and then we get nothing from this computer. Clearly, we're getting something, so at least they're okay enough to get power but you don't want to run them like that long term. Now, if you've done a recap, you've reseeded your ROM, your RAM, and your et cetera, okay, you should be good to go. The last thing I'm going to tell you to look for is going to be dry solder joints, cracked PCBs, delaminated PCBs, and et cetera. Now, as far as I can tell, there are no dry solder joints on this logic board, and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that Apple used modern techniques when it came to the manufacture of their logic boards, basically meaning they use some kind of robotics technology to do it. 
The analog boards, however, are a little bit different of a story. And that's because they went ahead and they contracted those out to other companies that focused their efforts on CRTs. And if you have any experience with arcade tech, you know arcade monitors are notorious for dry solder joints inside of their PCBs, especially Wells Gardner units. I don't want to get into that right now because it, I have nightmares when it comes to uh, Wells Gardner units, but it's true. So it's something we're going to have to take a look at later on in this build, or if you're having issues, something you may want to look at as well. Now, when it comes to an analog board, a lot of the same rules apply, but the technology that you're going to find inside of an analog board as compared to a logic board, okay, it's just not nearly as modern. So you're not going to find any aluminum electrolytic capacitors. You're going to find OG electrolytic capacitors, and even them, they're going to share space with film capacitors, which as far as I can tell, don't even have, okay, a serviceable life. So when we talk cat kits, they're actually really easy to go ahead and repair. They're also really easy to tell when they fail because they will leak just like aluminum electrolytic capacitors, but they typically bulge before that, kind of saving you, okay, a little bit of time and effort as far as cleaning up a board if it does leak. Now, as far as the bulging is concerned, this board doesn't have any, and it's probably because they're all Nichicon capacitors, which are super high quality. So this one actually looks like it's in really good shape. There's no real big heat marks on it. I'm not worried about anything like the high voltage circuit, the uh, vertical or horizontal circuit. That's somewhere else to take a look at in the board because they generate a lot of heat and that can cause cracking. And the last thing you want to worry about is going to be your flyback transformer. Flyback transformer in this one is relatively small because it's a small screen, so they don't generate nearly as much heat as, say, a 25-inch television or maybe like a 19-inch arcade monitor, all right, but you still have the same things to worry about. In this case, there's no cracking that can be seen. There's no delamination around the board. There's no dry solder joints that I can see, and I'm pretty sure that everything here is actually in really good shape. Now, I don't know if you have a bad flyback transformer, if you can get them from these, if it's like arcade monitors, they're easily found. It may be that you need to swap out a whole analog board. I haven't done enough research to know what that answer is, so your mileage will vary. But at least if you know, hey, there's a big crack inside of this thing, you shouldn't turn it on. It will arc inside of your case, and you never know what other components it's going to take with it. Because unlike just a regular old display that sits separate from your actual PC, this display is inside of your PC. And that arcing, that thousands of volts arcing, could damage a lot of equipment. All right, so look, to be completely honest, I really believe this motherboard needs a cap kit. It's just beyond the scope of this video. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and button this thing back up and power it on and see what happens. I don't think anything's going to change from our cold open. I know I, I reseated the RAM, I cleaned the contacts, but I don't have a ROM puller, so I didn't do any of that. I don't have a new PRAM battery to go ahead and give that a test. And to be completely honest, if I had the time and this was a rebuild, I would have went ahead and put this into an alcohol bath inside an ultrasonic cleaner before I went into the cap kit. We're just not there with this video, and that's okay. Those are some ideas for you if you run into the same problems. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm more interested in turning this into a modern computer than a classic. So I might as well go ahead and just at least button it back up so I have a nice neat package to store while I work on some other things before we get to the meat and potatoes of this project. All right, so look, I'm ready to go ahead and power this on. I didn't put the exterior case back together because I didn't think it was necessary. I don't always suggest people do that, especially if they're not comfortable. But for me, I have enough experience both doing it safely and shocking myself that I'm not too concerned. It'll allow me to go ahead and kind of hear things as they turn on, see if I hear any pops, any zips, any whatever, electrical sounds, okay? Especially because so much of this is analog. It'll give me a better idea, um, at least if what I did solved any problems or just kind of made everything the same. Moment of truth. So, power's on. Not hearing anything that acts like it's got life. I'm gonna take a look here. Uh, different pattern. I don't know what that's about, but just as I thought, this uh, this thing's for the most part kind of DOA until I actually put some real work in. Look, to be completely honest, that that actually makes me feel better about using the case 
and just setting some of the components aside to work on later. Um, I know that might not make some of you happy, but for me personally, that's what this project was about. So it makes me sleep a little bit better at night knowing I'm not ruin ruining a working uh, compact Mac. All right, well that about wraps up this video. I wanna thank you so much for dropping by. I'm hoping it wasn't disappointing if you showed up thinking we were gonna revive a compact Mac that just wasn't in the cards. You know, third time's a charm, but it's just beyond the scope of this video. And to be honest, beyond the scope of this entire series. Now that's not to say that the hardware inside of this is beyond repair because it really is in good shape and I'm hoping for those of you that were looking for kind of a guide what to look for when it came to powering on and reviving old tech at least have somewhere to start. If you've got any questions any comments please go ahead and write them below. If you liked what you saw don't forget to smash that like button and if you're interested in the next episode in the series, where we go ahead and revive a Mac Mini that will ultimately find itself inside of this case, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the update. But that's all there is for now. Again, thanks for dropping by, and we'll see you next time.